Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Mr. Jimny Zhu will defend his academic thesis entitled Transient and Persistent Aspects of Human Platelet Activation. Dear Mr. Candidate, may I invite you to present a summary of your studies and the conclusions of your thesis in the next 50 minutes. And I give you the word. Thank you, dear Prorector. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear family, friends, and colleagues, welcome and thank you for attending this special day for me. My PhD research is finished, resulting in this thesis. In the next 15 minutes, I will give you an overview of my research which is about transient and persistent aspects of human platelet aggregation. First, I want to start my presentation by talking about cardiovascular vascular disease, which are the leading cause of death globally. More than half a billion people around the world continue to be affected by cardiovascular vascular disease, which are content for 20.5 million deaths in 2021, close to a third of all deaths globally. Hemostasis is our body's normal reaction to an injury that causes bleeding. This reaction stops bleeding and allows our body to start repairs on the injury. This capability is essential to keep you alive, particularly with significant injuries. Well, under normal situation, the blood is kept float and flowing. When a vessel is damaged, the vessel, blood platelets, and the clotting factors will work together to limit blood loss. First, the vessel constructs it, then platelets will form a clot, which is then stabilized by the formation of the coagulation end product fibrin. It's very important that this all works well and this process of clot formation is tightly controlled. And the use of antiplatelet therapy has become an essential component of cardiovascular vascular disease treatment. For example, 90% of the population of at-risk adults took aspirin daily to prevent heart disease. Well, the inhibition of platelet responsiveness has decreased the, the occurrence of ischemic events. It also leads to side effects of bleeding that perpetrating the therapeutic challenges of preventing thrombosis while well least preserving hemostasis. In this process, platelets, of course, are the most important cells. Upon vascular damage, Resting platelets become active by binding to collagens in the broken vessel. They then release secondary mediators like ADP to active more platelets to build up a thrombosis when fibrinogen interact reactions. The activation process is transient, but uh, it can also be persistent. And there are vast majority of signaling receptor agonists in, is capable to induce platelet aggregate formation. There are two main receptors in this process, which are GP6 and PAR. Upon platelet activation, cytosolic calcium increased, which can be mediated when aura vastim one channel. This also envelops protein kinase activation. GP6 and PAR signalings can also initial integral alpha 2 b beta 3 activation. And the activated integral alpha 2 b beta 3 then bind to fibrinogen and cause platelet aggregation. Well, this activation leads to a persist or transient integral activation is up till now not fully understood. Therefore, in this thesis, we aim to better understand how the transient and persistent platelet aggregation works and establish the function of mean signaling elements, protein kinase C and the intracellular calcium. So in my thesis, chapter three and four, we use a time-dependent assay 
treat isolate platelets with the uh, agonist or inhibitor in different order. Uh, then we measure this platelet integral alpha to B beta 3 activation by flow cytometry. So we active platelets from GP6 and PAR signal, and we found both uh, pathway caused uh, almost completely integral alpha to B beta 3 activation after 10 minutes. However, after 20 minutes, the GP6 and the PAR caused the integral alpha to B beta 3 activation reduced, which may mean integral alpha to B beta 3 closure. So we think GP6 and PAR1 caused a partly transient integral activation, and there is a persistent alpha to B beta 3 activation when PAR4 pathway. We then tested 10 different inhibitors involved in this process. Here we show how the inhibitors reduce the persistent alpha 2 B beta 3 activation, in which the protein candy C inhibitor showed the highest effect can inhibiting all agonists induced integral activation. In addition, the ADP also essential for integral alpha 2 B beta 3 activation. Whereas several channel types have proposed to contribute to the calcium inter process, their relevant strengths and the contribution are unknown in response to GP6 and PAR. So in the chapter 4 to 6, we also used the time-dependent assay to treat platelets, and then use a 96 well plate based high throughput assay to perform a panel calcium measurement with FRA2 loaded human platelets in response of extra EGTA or calcium. Here we stimulated platelet when PAR1 or GP6, then added a, a second agonist when PAR1 or GP6. This uh, figures indicated that PAR1 stimulation protect uh, against the secondary stimulation of itself. However, uh, pre uh, GP6 stimulation provoked uh, a prolonged and high activation state, which still allowed the platelets to respond to a second uh, PAR1 or GP6 agonist. And in the following chapter five, we treated platelets with several inhibitors uh, related to the calcium channel and stimulated platelets from GP6 and PAR, in which the two ORA1 channel blockers showed the strongest effect in preventing the risk of uh, uh, intracellular calcium. So we conclude that ORA1 is a dominating calcium carrier regulating GP6 and PAR induced calcium inter in human platelet. In the chapter six, we also discovered an abnormal calcium inter response in platelets from the patients with ORA1 dysfunction. Here we use the calcium elevating agent, which can uh, enlarge the calcium inter. Compared to health control, the response to calcium after pretreatment with the calcium elevating agent was almost completely lost in the patient's platelet. This also can indicate ORA1 channel is the most important calcium channel in platelet. In the same chapter, we also test the platelets in presence of the calcium elevating agent and then trigger this platelet with extra calcium. Similarly, we observed that ORA1 inhibition caused a completely block it is also worth noting that protein kinase C inhibitors can increase the calcium inter, while the calcium inter is nearly completely blocked by overall PKC stimulation, which are the same as ORA1 channel did. At start, last in chapter six and seven, we used the thrombin generation assay which can continuously marry thrombin generation. Here we use the platelet uh, PKC inhibitor and the activator. 
we found in pilots, PKC can increase the peak of thrombin generation and shorten the lag time, but the PKC activator can only shorten the lag time to thrombin generation. So in summary, uh, we think in platelets uh, stimulated when GP6 and uh, uh, or PAR, persistent integral alpha to be beta 3 activation and platelet aggregation is increased by PKC and released ADP. And the memory of after pre or PAR1 stimulation is transient compared to pre or GP6 stimulation. And in platelets, the most important calcium interchannel is ORA1. In, at last, the ORA1 mediated uh, calcium inter is decreased by PKC, resulting in suppressed coagulation. Thank you for your attention, and I give word back to the prorector. Thank you very much, Mr. Candidate. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhu, for your interesting and detailed presentation well illustrated and well in time, so that, that gives our members of the Corona some additional minutes to discuss with you. So a bit before starting that, I'm going also to introduce your promotion team, so the members uh, who are sitting here in the audience. Right across on the other side of the table, on the left side here for me, it is on your right side, is uh, the first promoter is Professor Heemskerk. He's Professor of Cell Biochemistry of Thrombosis and Hemiostasis. On a little bit further to, your, to the audience, to the right here, it's uh, Dr. Swieringer. Dr. Swieringer is senior investigator at Sinus Research Institute, also for Maastricht. And finally, also the last member of the promotion team is Professor Tenkart, and he's professor of clinical thrombosis and hemiostasis, and they all work together with the candidate. Saying this, we're going to uh, start now the opposition, and the opposition will be opened by the chairman of your assessment committee, Professor Koenen, and Professor Koenen is professor in vascular inflammation and thrombosis. And for your information in the audience, we have six members in the corona today. There are five on site who are present, and there is one online, and I will introduce him later. And I'd like to give now the word to Professor Koenen. Thank you, Mr. Paul Rector. Dear candidate, I would like to take this occasion first to give you my compliments on this very, very nice thesis and very coherent thesis. Um, I've read it with interest and you impressed me by this really large body of experimental work that you did in this thesis. It's a lot and uh, I really, that's very impressive. And I'm the first to ask questions, so I would like to warm up a little bit with a conceptual question. And that's a concept that is central in your chapter three, also uh, in chapter two, and to lesser extent, I think, in chapter four, that's integrin closure. And I would like to ask you just to summarize and explain a little bit what actually drives and regulates integrin closure. And what is integrin closure? Is that a cytoskeleton-driven mechanism, or a protease-driven mechanism, or maybe other mechanisms, or both? Can you, can you explain a little bit to me first, before we move to the uh, more uh, detailed questions? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind word and question. So for the integrin, uh, we mainly focus on the integrin alpha to be beta 3, and uh, we think the integrin open and closure is based on the conformation change. So uh, we use uh, PEC1, antibody to test uh, this integrin activation, which can, which can only bind to uh, uh, active the integrin. Mm. So uh, during our experiment, we test by flow cytometry, and we think the positive uh, platelets with the integrin activation means the integrin uh, conformation is open. And for the negative uh, platelets, we think the conformation is closure. But it also can be uh, in um, intermediate formation for the integrin, but it's uh, uh, because our equipment are limited, so we don't know how the intermediate integrin. We think it's also be tested as open, maybe. Okay, so 
that's, uh, that's, that's uh, a fine answer already. And um, it's also a perfect introduction to my next question, because I would like to take you to uh, page 51 in your written thesis or printed thesis. Uh, that's figure one. And you also showed it in your presentation. You activate your platelets. You see PAC1 binding instantaneously going up. I guess it's instantaneously. Um, and then after some time, it goes down again, but not with every stimulus. So how does this relate? We know that that integrin alpha 2b beta 3 is a very abundant integrin. How, how does this relate to the total amount or the total number of integrin on the on the surface? Can you can you estimate how much would be in, ex, uh, activated compared to the to the uh, the total ones? Yes. So there are like uh, ten. Uh, 80,000 or like uh, 20, 120 copies per platelet. And, but it, on each platelet surface, the integrin con uh, concentration are expressed are different. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so here we think um, for 10 minutes, all the, almost uh, all the integrin are open, but after 10 minutes, uh, after 20 minutes, uh, some integrin Closer, which are the uh, maybe are the young platelets, or are the uh, have less integrin platelets. And for the not open platelets, we think it may be because the, this um, platelets have more integrin uh, receptors, and uh, so we test it still open. Okay. So so, so you, your, what I can distill from your answer is said that all the integrins are activated and that younger platelets might have, I think you said less, but uh, yeah. Okay, so you, you use flow cytometry in this chapter. And flow cytometry is basically an antibody binding to a cell and you get a fluorescent signal. So what do you think if you see, uh, the, um, if you see the signal go down? What is that? Is that the confirmation closure and then the antibody doesn't bind anymore? Or could it also be proteolytic removal of your integrin from the surface and that leads to reduced binding? What, what, what do you think drives this signal drop in your figure? Yes, because we also did an experiment under the microscopy. So we hmm? do see some integrin uh, active, no, some platelet active, and the ship, then they ship change back to the resting platelet. So we may think the integrin may uh, go back to, uh, from the surface to the intern. Okay. Ah, oh, th that's the third mechanism then, not even proteolytic removal, but then also internalization and at some point recycling. That's very interesting. Um, have you determined during that process the total integrins? by a non-specific confirmation specific antibody uh, so we only use the pack uh, no we also test other uh, peptide and mm -hmm. other fluorescence uh, peptide and we think the pack one is uh, most uh, uh, fit our experiment because it can only bind to the active integrin mm -hmm. and so uh, because uh, as they all say, uh, we don't have more uh, equipment to test how the integrin shape changed. Mm -hmm. It may be uh, used like uh, cellular uh, microscopy in future, but for now we can't see how the uh, integrin conformation do looks like. Okay, good. Then um, you did all these experiments quite a lot in chapter three, and am I correct to say that they are mostly uh, or mainly in free-floating free platelet suspensions, these experiments? Yes, it's all in uh, isolated platelets only. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Suppose if you would bind your platelets to a surface, for example, a surface containing immobilized fibrinogen, would you still have these mechanisms of integrin closure and, and, and opening, and, and would they be the same as in free solution? Can you can you speculate a little bit on this? Yes, I can imagine if we bend fibrinogen on the like glass and flow mm -hmm. these platelets. Um, at the beginning, the platelets may uh, adhere to this fibrinogen, but uh, like uh, as time goes by, the 
parties can still go back to a resting. Uh, so I think the aggregation may uh, be worse. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I've, ta I've taken track of the time. I think I have a little question about um, the impact section, if I'm allowed. You're allowed. A Thank quick you. question. Yes. Okay. So in the impact section, you talk about chapter three and the impact, and you say, okay, flow cytometry is uh, used for can be used for clinic testing because it can rapidly analyze thousands of cells in mm -hmm. mixtures per second. You write this on page two hundred and fifteen, just for reference. Um, so, how would you envision using the knowledge about integrin closure in chapter three? How could you take that to platelet testing in a patient setting? For example, to test the eff efficiency of antiplatelet drugs. How could you take this information for clinical use? Can you briefly maybe comment on this? Yes. Uh, so, for some patients use antiplatelet drugs. They may have bleeding uh, side effect. So as we uh, discovered in this chapter, we think we can use another agonist to like ADP can reduce this uh, bleeding side mm -hmm. effect. So that's what I think I can be used in clinic. clinic. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. I give the work back to the provider. Thank you very much. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Paul. He was a member of the assessment committee and is professor in pharmacology and cell biology from the University of Bristol in the UK. And I'd like to thank him that he came all the way from the UK to visit us today. Professor Paul, I'd like to give you the word. Thank you very much, Mr. Prorector, uh, for the introduction. And also thank you, Mr. Candidate, uh, for uh, a, a, an excellent presentation and an excellent thesis I to uh, very much enjoyed reading it. It's a very thorough and um, extensive study that you've done. Uh, so I'd like to, to move to chapters six and seven on PKC and red blood cell PS exposure, just to ask a few questions about that. Um, we've done quite a lot of work on protein kinase C and protein kinase C inhibitors over the years as well, and I've always found it a little bit um, paradoxical that that on the one hand, protein kinase C is a positive regulator of various signaling events that are important to platelets, but at the same time, inhibiting PKC, you can get some enhancement of some uh, events in cells, in particular the cell calcium, which you've shown. I wonder whether you could just um, help me to try to understand that, what seems to be a bit of a paradox, that some uh, signals are enhanced and others are suppressed by PKC? Yes. Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your questions. So for the protein kinase C, there are three different types of uh, S-forms. So the, for the uh, conventional S-forms, like alpha, beta, and gamma, they, uh, in some papers of like knocked out mass, they think it can be, uh, do a positive uh, regulate the platelet aggregation and calcium increase. But for the uh, novel uh, S forms like uh, theta or delta, so they think it's uh, like a negative, uh, uh, play a negative, negative role in the aggregation of platelet. Yes, okay, no, that, that does make sense. So you, you, you think it's principally a, a, a sort of isoform selective. Um, effect there, yeah. Um, so, do we do we have the right tools still uh, available, pharmacological tools, to be able to dissect that out very clearly? Do you think? Uh, yes. For now, we have uh, in some paper have the knockout mass, mm -hmm. and also we have specific uh, protein kinase inhibitors, which can specific uh, inhibit the certain S forms. Uh, but it's normally um, only in a low concentration of these inhibitors. Mm. And sometimes in a high uh, uh, concentration, the, these inhibitors can also uh, envelop in other pathways. So uh, in our experiment, we think at a low dose, we can use this uh, specific, we can think it's a specific protein kinase inhibitor. Yes, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You have to be careful, don't you, about the concentration that you use. I, I agree. 
um, to get specificity. Um, so I also wondered, downstream of the calcium signal, which is enhanced by PKC in inhibitors generally, um, you mention um, and study PS exposure in chapter six, um, and thrombin generation rather as well. Um, but are there other um, calcium-dependent responses that you could have looked at which might also be enhanced by the PKC inhibitors? Uh, yes, so in um, our results, we can see the protein candidacy inhibitors uh, in one, four, three, page, and uh, the, the pan uh, PKC inhibitors can raise the uh, PS exposure and the um, uh, PI, uh, PKC activator can reduce this PS exposure. Uh, so, uh, because it may be like uh, PME can, uh, PI, uh, the PME, the, which is the PKC uh, activator, can uh, increase the platelet secretion in data. Uh, and, but can also in the uh, thrombin generation part, we think the PME can increase the, uh, can shorten the lifetime of thrombin generation, maybe uh, uh, can make it faster, but not stronger. Faster, but not stronger. Okay, yes. so it has an effect on the kinetics of the response. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. No, thank you. Um, so I wonder whether I can link this, the results that you've got in chapter six through to um, sort of PS um, exposure uh, that you that you've got in the, in the subsequent chapter. Uh, I wonder whether um, uh, you you looked at um, calcium entry mechanisms, and do you think that PKC then is uh, directly regulating one of the principal calcium entry mechanisms to enhance the PS exposure? Then, uh, so for the PKC. Um it's also we uh, talked about in the introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be active by the calcium, uh, the internal calcium, and then the PKC can cause a, a shape change, and which there are C1 domain can bind to the deck, and then it can um, keep uh, keep uh, active this platelet aggregation in the downstream, mm -hmm. and. Okay, yeah, no, it's, it's a complex interaction, isn't it, where PKC may be regulating calcium, but in turn, calcium also can regulate PKC, so. Yes. Um, yeah, yes. okay, thank you. So can I just ask you uh, a couple of quick questions then around about the, the following chapter, chapter seven, which is very interesting on um, PS exposure, not only from, um, from platelets, but also from red cells. So it was interesting to hear that they have a significant contribution. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to know, um, do you think then in a clotting response in the body, what, what's the relative contributions that red cells would play relative to platelets? Are they playing equal roles? Or? Yes, so in our bodies, uh, because the red blood cell have more uh, count than the platelets, and uh, based on our result, we think the, the red blood cells can do a primer uh, PX exposure, which can help the platelet, uh, uh, no, help the, uh, the blood to start the thrombin generation. And, but the platelets can only uh, express uh, only like 0.5% red blood cell uh, can expose this PS. So it's uh, still not enough for the aggregation. No, although of course, there are many more red blood cells than there are platelets in the body, aren't there? So um, it may only be a small number, a small percentage, but it's a small percentage of a lot of cells, isn't it? So. Yes, and also the red blood cell, red blood cell can uh, provide a surface for the, for this platelet aggregation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and so one last question then. Um, I think you, you sort of intimated in uh, the beginning of chapter seven, I think on page 158, um, that there was effectively a sort of crosstalk between the PS signaling in red blood cells and activation of platelets. I didn't quite follow what you meant there. How do, how do the red blood cells 
Yes. So we um, isolate the red blood cells from the healthy donor, mm -hmm. and we act, normally active this blood, red blood cell with the NX5, and then we put it back to like PR, uh, PRP or PPP, mm -hmm. and then we measure. For mm -hmm. other experiments, we um, like we also compared with the whole blood. It's only a uh, whole blood at the NX5, so mm -hmm. it can be in all the uh, cells, but not only in red blood cells. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's a different. Okay, so you were able to isolate the red blood cell PS exposure in the first experiment, um, yes. uh, but not in the second. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Reutelingsperger. He is Emeritus Professor in Biochemistry of Apoptosis at our university and also, uh, was also a member of your assessment committee and I'd like to give him the word. Thank you, Mr. Pro-Rector. Uh, dear candidate, I also want to start with uh, giving my compliments uh, to you about this uh, wonderful thesis. Uh, I read it with uh, lots of pleasure. And it's, it's another step, I think, an important step to, under, to our understanding of the role of platelets, how they act in physiology and, and uh, pathology. And I may say, may say that's one of the major scientific missions of your promoter. And I also would like to include the promotion team for my compliments. I would like to uh, start a discussion with you about um, one of your topics of, of your thesis, and that is the reversibility of the platelet activation. And in your chapter eight, which is uh, a beautiful discussion uh, of your findings in perspective of what, what is uh, the background of, of uh, platelet physiology and pathology, you state on page 198, you state that if the P2Y12 receptor is inhibited by antiplatelet drugs, for example, then um, these inhibitors can revert previously activated platelets into the circulation. Can you please explain that to me? Yes. Highly esteemed op opponent, thank you for your kind word and question. So in chapter eight, uh, it's a conclusion. Uh, we think uh, if we block the we tried to block P2Y1 and P2Y12, uh, and we found the only big band the P2Y12 can um, stop the integrin activation. Mm -hmm. And also we use uh, ADP to active this uh, P2Y12, and we found um, we use like um, CRP or TRAP6, after 20 minutes, the integrin closed, and if we add extra ADP, the integrin can partly uh, open again, so com compared to uh, without the ADP. Yeah, so you obviously you extrapolate your uh, in vitro findings to the in vivo situation by the sentence, at least that is how I read it. And, but how do I have to see that in, in vivo? when there is a thrombus formation and the uh, P2Y12 receptor is inhibited, are activated platelets within the thrombus released from the thrombus then? Or how do I have to see that? Uh, yes, because in vivo, we also have other uh, factors, uh, coagulation factors. So it may not only um, um, active this pathway, but uh, can also uh, active um, from the other receptors. So it's much yeah, yeah. complex than the only platelet alone. So, but, but do I understand correctly that platelets that are activated in a growing thrombus, for example, can leave that thrombus by some receptor-mediated mechanism? Uh, yeah. And what do you know what the activation status is of these platelets? Uh, is that confined to several activation stages or is this a global activation of the platelet? Uh, it may be uh, extrinic uh, pathways and so maybe uh, from the tissue factor part and then the platelets can start to uh, uh, 
like swarming generation first, and okay. then ac active the other receptors. Uh, yeah. But, Do yeah. they secrete, for example, their uh, granular content mm -hmm. in, the, in, in the thrombus and are then released? I'm, I'm also curious, what do you think, what happens to these platelets that are released from the thrombus, have been activated? Perhaps there is a reversibility of the activation program and they come into circulation. What, what, happen, what will happen to these platelets? Yes, yeah, so the platelets, when activated, they can uh, release a second mediator uh, and also like uh, alpha granule. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm thinking uh, if they can uh, release, for example, ADP, they can uh, be active and then shape change and then the integrin can still open. So okay. The okay. planet can still no. active. Would you, would you think there is a there is a kind of target for uh, a, a biomarker for uh, a biomarker for an activated uh, thrombotic process in patients? Do these platelets offer something uh, that can act as a biomarker that tells us something about the uh, thrombotic? processes going on in the patient? Uh, so for the patient, I, I think uh, they may have some uh, receptor closed, but uh, but because the platelets have uh, different receptor can be activated, and uh, so I think uh, we, it depends on which uh, dysfunction this patient have. Okay, oh yeah, that's, uh, that's for sure. Uh, Mr. Prorector, do I still have some time? One and a half minute. One and a half minute. I, I would like to follow up on the, on the previous um, opposition by Professor Paul. And so a growing thrombus in, in, the, in, in, in a patient, for example, you nicely um, um, hypothesize in, in um, Chapter 7 that the erythrocyte have a... a an important role in, in uh, providing phosphatidylserin to, uh, to the thrombus for thrombin generation. Now, only a small percentage of, of these erythrocytes, they expose PS, and these are probably the aging erythrocytes about to be cleared from the circulation. Um, is there any enrichment of these aged Erythrocyte, is there an, a mechanism that enriches these aged erythrocytes in the thrombus? So are there adhesive proteins or some structural changes known on, on the surface of the erythrocytes that make them uh, uh, that become enriched in a thrombus, so entrapped in a thrombus? Do you know anything about that? Uh, for the for this patient, because it's um, mostly, uh, it's because we don't have a lot of patients, so we yeah. collect uh, uh, as enough, uh, no, as much as we can, we can collect. And we also found um, in the same dysfunction of uh, the same patients, they have different, for example, platelet yeah. counts. But do you think yeah. it's no, a no, stochastic we process? Have, we have to stop one question. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm satisfied with the yes. answers. I give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you. I'm sorry for you, but we have to continue. We continue now online with uh, Professor Steckner. He is a professor in vascular imaging and was a member of your assessment committee. And I would like to thank him that he joins us today from Würzburg University. Thank you. with a general question, so more or less I'm related to your general discussion chapter, you have assessed several aspects of bladed activation. If you would now go to a pharmaceutical, which target would you bet your money? So what would be your preferred target to inhibit bladed activation? You know, highly uh, esteemed opponent, so if I understand which you mean which uh, receptor I prefer to ta ta uh, as a antiplatelet target? Yes, receptor or signaling pathway. Yes. 
based on our, our uh, thesis, I think the Aura 1 channel may be a, a novel uh, antiplatelet pathway because it's, uh, it's in an upper stream of platelet aggregation. So if we can block this calcium, we can uh, block the platelet activate from the beginning. And, and what about potential side effects of, of targeting ORI1? The ORI1 uh, inhibitors, uh, normally they have other side effects and because they can also affect uh, other cells, not only platelets, like muscle cells, neural cells. So if you ban the ORI1 channel, uh, other uh, systems in your body may be damaged and uh, uh, which is most important, it's in uh, the, the in, uh, uh, for the uh, patients, they have some dysfunction and other dysfunction, not only the bleeding. Okay. And I would come to your introductory chapter um, where you introduce basically um, the platelet integrins and you come to outside in signaling and um, you correctly cited a literature that there's a role of sick um, downstream of the SARC family kinases in outside-in signaling. How would you test, or how can you in general test outside-in signaling in, in platelets? Uh, so for test uh, a, sp a specific signaling in platelets, uh, normally we use some inhibitor to bind a specific uh, protein or molecules um, or receptors, and for example, we use like a uh, uh, apres to bind the P2 ADP. Uh, it's in our uh, normal protocol be because we don't want to the start don't want the start uh, the platelet start active by the P2Y uh, receptors, and it's it's in all the uh, isolate platelets, and also we can use some uh, uh, mass model to specific uh, uh, knockout uh, gene. So that's also a position. Uh, uh, we can also use this mass model to test the specific uh, receptor or signal. Yeah, this was actually the reason why I asked um, because we have analyzed mice lacking sick and if you perform um, bladelet spreading assay or clot detection, which is classically assumed to be a surrogate for outside in signaling, we did not observe a major difference. So I was wondering um, whether you have, but you have not assessed the effects of a sick inhibitor on bladelet spreading on, in, on your own in your experiments. Uh, so in our uh, experiment, we don't uh, evaluate the uh, like mass model, we only have some uh, dysfunction patient with uh, ORA1 and STEM1 dysfunction, and yes, and then we can compare to our uh, healthy donor control, and then we can investigate how the difference between the patient and the uh, healthy donors. That's what I we we can do here. Okay. And I would come to chapter four. They did these nice um, kinetic studies. Um, and then at a certain time point after activation or before activation, you added inhibitors like tirofibane or iloprost or a sick inhibitor. Um, is there any way to exclude that a part of the different kinetic effects comes from the mode of action or diffusion? So, in so like, because a sick inhibitor would have to enter a bladelet, while tirofibarn could directly block TB2B3A. So did you do preliminary experiments beforehand to, to see how, how fast the inhibitor reaches its target? Uh, so here we use a different time point to add the inhibitors and the agonist. Uh, in page 28, uh, 82, in page 82, we found uh, even though we uh, add these sick inhibitors, uh, 
before two minutes we active the platelet um, there's no uh, uh, decrease of platelet aggregation so this may mean the uh, the sick may envelop in a much dense layer of the uh, platelet aggregation pathways but for the for example we see in page 80 we use allopost and we can see it, even though we add this agonist and the inhibitor together there's no aggregation uh, in this process so uh, it really depends on the pathway which uh, the inhibitor blocked this is one conclusion but couldn't it also be that it depends on the the efficacy or the onset rate of the inhibitor? Uh, do, do you get my point? Uh, you mean the the PKC inhibitors in before? So like a sick inhibitor would have to enter the the, the platelet, while iloprost would not. So could this also contribute to the difference? In kinetics, yes, for the sick inhibitor, we uh, do not see it. It's only can it's because it's in the pathway uh, of GP six activation, but not the par uh, par one activation. So for the uh, GP six pathway, it can works. It works uh, because we can see in page eighty two uh, the EF. If you uh, first stimulate, uh, treat the platelet with sick inhibitor, there's no more aggregation by CRP activator. Okay. Just a brief question to chapter five. You used a sodium calcium exchanger inhibitor, so like the ORM1013, um, um, and saw a subtle effect with regard to reduction in calcium mobilization. Or influx. Um, did you also assess whether this inhibitor had a more general effect on, on platelet um, fitness or functionality given the general role of um, these exchanges? In, uh, it's in 114. So yeah. we, we use this uh, uh, ORM because it can uh, inhibit the. Uh, so the calcium exchange channel, but this channel can be uh, uh, there are two pathways. So at resting platelet, the channel can uh, let the calcium into the intracell, but when the platelet uh, activation, uh, the surface may be like a positive, and then they let the calcium goes uh, goes out from the intracell. So. Uh, we, we think in the beginning of the platelet aggregation, the this channel play a positive way. So if we inhibit it, it may uh, uh, reduce the calcium into the platelet. But after like a few minutes, the platelet are already active. The uh, the calcium should be re reduced. But if we block this channel, uh, the calcium count goes out from the intracellular, so that it may play a okay. uh, do pathways. Thank you. I'm done. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dijkgraaf. She is a professor of biomimetic chemistry and also a member of your assessment committee, and I'd like to give her the word. Yeah, thank you, Pro Rector. Uh, dear candidate, First of all, I would like to congratulate you on the completion of your PhD thesis. I also would like to congratulate your promotion team with this. You did a lot of work that has been said already before, so uh, my compliments. It was a joy to read your thesis, but yeah, of course I still have some questions. And I would like to go with you to chapter 7, where you describe the role of uh, red blood cells and, uh, and uh, phosphatidylserine. Uh, on page 165, there you mention, together this pointed to a hematocrit-dependent enhancing effect on thrombin generation that was annulled by pretreatment of the red blood cells with annexin 5. 
Well, I like to run and uh, I, I like endurance sports, uh, especially I like uh, running marathons and half marathons. And when I read this, I thought, do I now have to worry about my blood coagulation? Can you give me an answer on this question? Yes. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind of word and the question. Uh, so in the healthy hu uh, human body, the uh, all, all, uh, all blood cells run well, so I don't think you need to worry about uh, <laughs> that. Um, so after you enjoy it, and there, uh, the blood will start to activate and also other uh, blood cells, for example, uh, white blood cells can uh, uh, provide, uh, provide a service and for the platelet and also the red blood cells uh, can release the red vesicle, which can also uh, provide a service for the clot. Mm -hmm. uh, so because the red blood cell the concentration is much higher than platelet, so even though a uh, a small amount of red blood cells are active, the PS exposure, uh, it can still help you, help you to uh, stop the bleeding. Yeah, but you described there that uh, hematocrit levels are playing a role. That at least that's what, what, I, what I saw also in one of your figures. There you add red blood cells and then you see that the thrombin generation uh, increases. Is that then playing a role or is it... Uh, is it really the phosphatidylserine? What, what, what is now really the, the causative agent that, that in, increases the, the thrombin generation? Um, yes, for the red blood cells, it's on, uh, in our result, it only play uh, the, a small role in the, but it's significant uh, in the pre uh, uh, thrombin generation pass. But if you can, uh, if we, uh, for example, we add uh, CRP in whole blood, uh, we can see the platelets may take over the uh, thermine generation part, uh, even, though you add, uh, you, even though you have the red blood cells. So um, I think uh, uh, still the uh, platelets play a main role in this thermine generation. Yeah, so uh, you say that, that platelets are the main contributor, uh, contributors to this and not the red blood cells, if um, I understand you correctly. I can see the red blood cell play a role in this thermal generation, but not uh, the most important yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, then we agree on that. Yeah. Um, then I have also a, a question about the patient you used in, in, in chapter 7, because you have one person there with a sickle cell anemia. And uh, there you see that uh, this person has uh, well, normal uh, thrombin generation levels, though I see that the uh, ETP is, is a bit higher there. But can you translate these results to the clinical situation? Um. Uh, well, in our result, we also test uh, anemia patients, but they uh, are in different ways. So some of them have, uh, uh, normally they have very low uh, platelet count, but some of them have a very high thrombin generation, but some of them uh, only have a limited thrombin generation. So yeah, but if, if I take into account the... the uh, the, 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 the form of these cells, how they look like, uh, I think it's very difficult to say something about the, the thrombin generation levels in, in the, this essay because uh, might it not be that, these, the, the, that the shape of these cells do play a role? If you, but that's what you, I think, only see in, in, uh, in the real in vivo situation in the patient. So because we didn't test uh, any... Um, uh, in vivo no, no, no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, but I can imagine that that these blood cells, these red blood cells, it's it's known that these patients do have difficulties because these uh, moon-shaped cells get stuck into to the vessel. So I think these these patients are really tr tr yeah getting problems with their blood coagulation because they get thrombosis or something like that. Yes, uh, I think these patients, the the red blood cells shapes are different mm. a bit uh, compared to the healthy donors. So uh, maybe they have uh, less uh, 
that surface can provide uh, provide a bending set to the yeah. platelet, so they may uh, limit it the uh, platelet to bend to the red blood cells. Yeah, that yeah, that's that's a good uh, aspect that you mentioned there. Indeed, the surface may also play a role over there. Yeah, yeah. I have a look at the product, though, but I, I'm still allowed to ask another you? question. Yes, you are. Yes, uh, because um, what I would like to know from you is, uh, you mentioned that you also did, uh, uh, you also investigated the, the role of white blood cells in chapter seven. You don't see an effect over there, but uh, I always thought that uh, thrombosis and, and, and uh, or at least blood clotting and, and uh, inflammation are interconnected. You don't see this, but am I missing here something or? Uh, did you do uh, your research not very well? Did you have to use another setup? Uh, yes, so in our result, we didn't uh, find the red, uh, the red blood cells uh, can contribute to, the, to this uh, thrombin generation. Uh, it's uh, showed in the 193, and we can only say the uh, red blood cells uh, are very related to the thrombin generation. Mm -hmm. And for the white blood cell, I think uh, they, in, in some vision part, they may uh, maybe provide some surface, but it's not in our result. We don't know how it works for yeah. now. It's a matter to investigate further. Yeah, we need, I yeah. think we need more concentration of white blood cells because yeah. in blood, uh, in blood, it's very low concentration of red blood cells. Yeah. Okay. I'm very happy with your answers, and I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much. Now the opposition will be continued, and I would like to mention already to Dr. Simone, we will continue a little bit over five o'clock, so you will get your full time to ask questions to the candidate. No worry about this. So we will move to Dr. De Simone. She is a postdoc at the Department of Synaptic Research Institute at Maastricht University, and I would like to give her the word. Thank you. <clears throat> Dear candidates, I would also like to congratulate you with this thesis, which I have read with a lot of interest, and I would like to extend my congratulations as well to your supervisory team. So first, I would like to ask one of your paranyms to read Proposition 5, please. Uh, <clears throat> in whole blood uh, thrombin generation, the red blood cells play an initial role, whilst the activity the platelets support this process at a later stage. Thank you. So you mentioned here activated platelets. So I was wondering, should we always in a trigger for whole blood TG at a platelet activator? Because in chapter seven, you used CRP to activate the platelets, is that from now on a good idea? Because that is not always done. Uh, esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your kind word and question. So in chapter seven, we, uh, we treat the, uh, the whole blood also with like tissue factor or RVV. And if we want to test how the platelet uh, play a role in this thermal generation, uh, I think we need to act, activate the uh, platelet activator first. So uh, here we add the CRP, which can only bind to GP6 uh, and activate the platelet. So we do see some uh, short, uh, in this um, situation, we see the zombie generation uh, increased and the lifetime are shortened by this agonist. Thank you. And should we done within this trigger at tissue factor or RVV10, or does that not really matter? Uh, based in our result, we found if we add a very low concentration of tissue factor, it already works well, like um, 0.1 peak molar. So it's very uh, low concentration as a trigger. So we prefer to use this. Uh, in the following uh, experiment. Okay, thank you. Then I would like to go to page 29, and here you mention uh, thrombus architecture. 
So could you maybe explain how the process of integrin activation, reversibility and inactivation fits in this model of uh, thrombus architecture? Uh, so platelet uh, first active like uh, uh, bind to collagen and then active TP6 and which then can um, active the downstream pathway like SIG and PLC gamma and then they can release IP3 and uh, DIG to active protein kinase C and also active the intracellular calcium. And in the next step, step they uh, can active the, alpha, the integrin uh, calling and the telling uh, chain. So, and then the integrin can active. And for other pathway uh, like PAR, it can active the PLC beta and then active the protein candidacy and it then goes the same way as the TP6. And so in our thesis, we think um, for the GP6, it's a reversible and the PAR1 also reversible. It may be uh, limited of the uh, secondary mediator release. So uh, it have less ADP than powerful activation. So there, if, if we also look at the architecture as a core and a shell model, then I think the highest reversibility would be in the shell, right? Yes. Okay. Um, then uh, I would like to go to page 88. And there you mentioned the concept of uh, thrombin receptor desensitization. And, and that concept is widely accepted in literature, but how are your experiments proving uh, thrombin receptor desensitization, or how are your experiments confirming this concept? Uh, so it's in 188? No, page 88. Okay. You okay. mentioned uh, PAR desensitization or thrombin receptor desensitization, so how is that proven in your experiments, this concept? Uh, yes, so uh, if we don't have these uh, receptors, um, so the platelets can only be active by GP6, which can provide a, a prolonged uh, uh, active uh, signaling, and but it's uh, limited for the platelet aggregation in, in the end. So if you don't have uh, the, the PAR receptors, um, it, the platelet activation may be very slow and not uh, enough for the clot formation. Okay. Um, so I saw that you uh, used quite a lot TRAP6 and CRP, and I was wondering why you did not choose uh, thrombin and collagen instead. Do you think that would have been maybe more physiologically relevant or do you think it was the best choice to use uh, TRAP6 and CRP in your experiments? Uh, yes, so for TRAP and the CRP it's much smaller than uh, thrombin and the collagen and it's always play a f much uh, faster th than those uh, agonists Dear Mr. Candidate, you can answer the questions, but you also can say it's enough, and you said, I'm stopping. It's up to you. Yeah, we are answer this question. You like to answer the question. Yes. Then I give you the opportunity to answer the question. Yes, so CRP and the TRAP6 uh, can act with the planets much faster than collagen and uh, the thrombin. Thank you. I'm pleased with your answers. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Zhu, Mr. Candidate, the time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will now withdraw, and we're going to discuss the quality of your thesis and particularly the way you have defended your thesis this afternoon. I request that you and the company here and this audience available wait for the results of our deliberations and the return to the aula. Thank you very much. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. Oh, 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 oh.
outside Seven miles in my rearview mirror I know what it felt like My goals only getting clearer East side to the west side No place like home If there's questions that you've got Go the extra mile and die Got my laces tied, long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because fate decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose that branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep park, cause we're taking off. Get the mileage,
Dear Mr. Zhu, dear Mr. Candidate Still, the degree committee here present has assessed not so much the quality of your thesis, because that has been approved already, but particularly the way you have defended your thesis this afternoon. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you officially the degree of doctor. Compliments. Professor Heemskerk is authorized to call up you, upon you this academic distinctions in accordance with Dutch academic customs. And I invite now your supervisor to take the floor for the official part. Professor Heemskerk. Please all rise. I will first get the promise. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible? Yes, I promise. Okay, then by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Jamie Zhu, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and other members of the committee and affix it with the official seal of the university. I give the word to your, to your promoter to speak out to the official loadout. Dear Dr. Zhu, dear Jimmy, it's a great honor for me as a first person to congratulate you with, your, uh, with the new doctor's degree at Maastricht University. And in my congratulations, of course, I also involve your wife, your family and friends who hopefully are uh, present here or will later see this on the live stream. You have made it today, done very well, and done, do, and done it in your own way. Always staying kind and positive, and it's the same kindness and positivity as you have written down in the acknowledgement pages of your thesis. With Google Translate, I also try to read the parts written in Chinese symbols, but as far as I understood, this is all kind and positive as well. It even seems to me that uh, the less positive experiences you had during your past four years are still stated in a very positive way. And this, I think, is an important, valuable attitude, as we have seen it also today during the thesis defense. You're bright man, you're excellent experimentator, and you're very reliable in science. I think that we have seen today. Then looking back, you have made an interesting yet straightforward journey. You finished a bachelor study in pharmacy and a master study in med medicinal chemistry, both at Shandong University, which is one of the top 15 universities in China. And uh, for a while, you uh, worked at a university-related pharmaceutical company to broaden your expertise and your research interest when you came to Maastricht were drugs, drugs and design, antioxidant and coagulation mechanisms, and biology of natural products. So when you came here, it was kind of clear that the, uh, your interest would match with the uh, current project. In 2018, you applied for a bursary at the Sinus School, uh, it's a Sinus Scholarship Council program which you received and you choose for a PGG trajectory in Maastricht uh, where your future wife also was working already. And I became involved a little bit after the beginning when Dr. Mark Roest and Professor Hugo ten Kerte uh, asked me to think on a challenging project that would be of interest to all of us. And when I remember well, it should be on platelets it should be on coagulation, 
should be on diagnostic test and include sufficient novelty and combine basic drug-related and patient-related research. In the beginning, your project was supposed to be carried out at the Synapse Research Institute Maastricht, later at where uh, uh, in my department and uh, the department of Hugo to, uh, in my department, the department of Hugo and Kate in Maastricht University, and gradually it moved as location uh, to the perfect combination of both institute given the intended program. Uh, the other day I had a look into your pro PhD program at the time that we made up in 2019 and it reads parts one and two to increase knowledge in the mechanisms and processes causing transient platelet activation and transient coagulation and then part three to assess the likely interfering role of red blood cells in the platelet-based control of coagulation, uh, and in this part, um, also patients from uh, blood samples from patients should be analyzed. So, uh, it was then concluded that the three parts to be carried out in four years have sufficient potential to result in four experimental papers to be published in international journals. Now, and now we look into your thesis, four years later, and in fact, it's exactly what you have done. You have just followed the program, and that's exceptional, and I think also a compliment. Though, it's two small exceptions on the program. The number of content chapters is six and not four, and the number of papers published is eight and not four. And it's all in excellent international journals, uh, and we know is the, of the two uh, chapters that are not yet published, we have just heard this week that say very likely will be accepted in good journals as well. So in the past four years, you have followed a clear and straight route to this thesis. Uh, and see, yeah, of, of course, there were some changes also. It was not all very straight in the program. The COVID time with lab closures was a difficult time also for you, and you use this time for, write, for writing an important review on your main subject, chapter two. And then, since the plated signaling became more and more important in your work, a year ago, Dr. Mark Roest agreed to hand over to Dr. Frauke Sveringer as a co-promoter. And further, you closely work together with several other PhD students in my group in the university and also in Synapse. And I think not intentionally, likely, but it seemed that uh, your favorite uh, colleagues uh, to work with were Italian, Spanish, German, Belgian, and Chinese. Uh, another big change recently was in your personal life, with your engagement back to China and the marrying, and congratulations also to you and to your wife with this important change. And then before closing, I want to thank the various Corona members present here in person or online for their willingness to assess uh, Jimny's thesis and the defense ceremony. Uh, Professor Stegner from Würzburg, thank you for bringing in your expertise in plated signaling, plated phenotypes and molecular biomolecular imaging. Professor Roy Kuhne, uh, Master of Universities, thanks for your willingness to chair this assessment committee. Professor uh, Lester Poole, thank you for coming over from Bristol and for your judgments and discussions on your favorite, favorite plated topics. And Professor Christel Leuksberg and Professor Ingrid Dijkraaf, thank you also for joining. We're grateful for your contributions to the examination and the procedure today. And Dr. Elia Simone from Synapse Research Institute, thanks for bringing in your expertise as well into reversible mechanisms of plated activation. And with this, I hand over the word back to the board. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Zhu, how does it feel? <laughs> Feels good? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> very good. So, on behalf of Maastricht University, I would like to congratulate you. And in my congratulations, I also take uh, also your promotion team, who guided you over the last... Uh, let's say four, four, a little bit more than four years, I think. And um, I wish you all the best and, and thank them too.
I also would like to thank the members of the Corona, already mentioned by the first promoter, but still as pro-rector, it's always good to see that we have so many, so many members in the Corona who ask questions to the candidate, and I would like to thank them for joining us from Brussels in the sun, I can see over there, yes, and also uh, Professor Sprenger from, uh, from Würzburg University. I give also my congratulations to your wife, and I know there are maybe some family members uh, present online, but in China it's now pretty late at the moment, so it's 12 o'clock in the night. I also would like to thank uh, the, the people in the audience. Um, uh, I think uh, what I would like to mention is that we see a good presentation, and I hope in the future to see some more PhD students to present their thesis here with us in the same, in the same statue. You have an important task, because I know you are a China Scholarship Council member, and you were in our cooperative program. I'm not sure if you, if you already return back to China or if you stay a little bit longer in Europe. I heard that you may be going to stay a little bit in Aachen. But in the case you're definitely going back to China, you are unimportant. And why? You will be our ambassador. You will be a, an ambassador of Maastricht in China. And we hope in our new program to send some master students or some PhD students to do some work in China. And I'm, I already congratulate you with that new ambassador function which you have. Mm -hmm. By saying this, I'm going to close. And how are we going to proceed? We're going to make a picture here with Professor Sprenger because he is online. And then afterwards, we're going to make a picture on the stairs of the, uh, of the hall here. But you don't have to wait for this. There is already uh, some tea, some wine, maybe some beer available at the rafter. And you can enjoy. And we will follow you in about 10 minutes. Thank you very much. And I'm closing this one. Well, 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 you take the, one of you take, let him take, and uh, join your, join him.